you are an entrepreneur, a professional, a speaker, or a coach, and although you've come a long way, it's time for you to take it to the next level. We've got you. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. We'll help you use authority and influencer marketing to build your business stronger and faster by publishing a book. You'll hear from guests that are thought leaders in sales, marketing, networking, communication, social media, promotion, and business leadership. Let's do it. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. And now your host, the extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder. Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast, and today I am joined by fellow proofreader, editor, and author John Clements, and I am looking forward to today's discussion because we're going to be looking at using your blog posts as a tool. See, we, we get this concept, oh, you just write the blog post, you put it on your website, it's there, somebody sees it. But no, you're using words. Words are powerful, so you might as well use them to build your business. So like I said, John is a professional proofreader, editor, and writer. He also runs an editing and writing agency. He helps businesses improve their written content to attract more people to their websites and convert them into new clients. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kim. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. I always love having conversations with fellow people in the industry because, you know, we can do a, a deeper dive into actually the power of words and, and how do you use them to build a business. So first, John, why don't you just share a little bit about yourself? How did you become a proofreader, editor, writer, and own an agency? Yeah, so I wasn't always a proofreader or editor or writer. I actually spent 15 years in the corporate world. I was in quality management. And so you say, well, that's like, how did you make that switch? The answer is COVID. So I actually lost my job in COVID, as so many of us did. And I promise it wasn't performance related. It was strictly economic. Um, but one thing that I did want to do with that is I said, okay, look, I have this opportunity now. What, what can I actually do that I want to do? Because I'll just be honest with you, after 15 years in the corporate world, I was, I was toast. I was ready to not do that again. So I looked back and said, well, what do I enjoy doing? And of those things, what could provide value to people? And so I, I kind of went back in, in my past and said, well, I always enjoyed proofreading and writing. I always you know, enjoyed English class. I was the dork who like wanted to learn Shakespeare in English, English class. I was also the guy who would like in college and seminary would willingly say, hey, do you want me to proofread your paper? I'll do it because I just enjoyed it. And so thinking about that, I thought, well, I wonder if people would actually pay me to do that. And as it turns out, people will pay me to do that. So that's really how I got my start was just leaning into my my passions, but not not just a passion, but a passion that could actually help people and help other people grow their businesses. So I started off with that, got on Upwork. I worked for 10 bucks an hour doing, you know, whatever, and I was able to see some success there. Yeah, Upwork and grow from there to the point where I actually needed to bring on more proofreaders and more editors to fulfill all the work. So that's that's where I am right now. Well, John, our stories aren't exactly the same, but we do have a few similar elements. Uh, I got into into ghostwriting in 2015 when my son was getting married, and we had two cars we were driving by faith. So, John, have you ever driven a car by faith before? I think I might be driving one by faith right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's where it's it's really no longer repairable or it's not worth repairing anymore, but you're trying to save up yeah. to get to the next vehicle. <laughs> so you get in the car and you pray to the good Lord that you make it, that you're going to where you're going to go. You do what you need to do. You get in the car and you pray, you make it back home. <laughs> yeah. And that was 2015 and my son getting married. So, of course, we were trying to put as much money as possible into, you know, making his day amazing. and. I had already authored books and I was on a free, I was on Upwork. I was on Upwork one day. I'm very creative, very talented, never asked me to draw anything. And my, my father was colorblind. So my color sense is pretty skewed. And I was looking for a graphic designer. And you know, one of those little God thoughts, why don't you check writing jobs? And I'm like, I can't believe what people were paying for writing. 
jobs. And, you know, within a year, I had so much coming in and not just writing, but editing. Now, I am not a great editor, but, you know, all sorts of things that I started a publishing company because, and I realized I loved it. But, you know, you, you talked about, you know, the fact that you were the person in university, you know, you proofed every base paper in that. So when I was first doing RTA publishing and when I was doing my books, it was my best friend who was my editor because she was the ultimate English major in university and she loved editing. So she actually started out at RTA publishing as editing and then she went on to become our book project manager. So, you know, there's similarities there. And I think sometimes you fall into things in life and you just don't realize they become your calling. Like it's just powerful. Yeah, I actually agree with that. Yeah, I feel I mean, I I tried a couple of different things during COVID because, you know, I don't know which ones are going to work or not work. And it happens that editing did work for me, but you're totally right. Like, I love it. I get this sense of satisfaction out of doing a good job. Uh, like I said, I know, you know, I know that makes me a complete nerd, but I just lean into it and I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. So yeah, I totally agree with you. And I definitely think that, uh, yeah, the whole God part is a, and a whole other piece that we could talk about for sure. <laughs> John, well, maybe we'll talk about that bit at the end, but, you know, I want to get into today's topic because... I think, you know, there's several misconceptions there, but I think entrepreneurs who aren't using their blog posts properly are wasting a lot of time and energy to do something that's not going to produce any results. So I guess probably one of the first obvious questions I, I should ask you is, can you use your blog posts, your articles, your things like that? Can you actually use them to attract business to you? Absolutely. So what I can do is I can actually give you and your listeners a basic three point, uh, three step process as to how to actually construct or structure your blog posts in a way to, to help with that goal. So real quick, the first thing you want to do is have a solid introduction that really hooks the reader. A lot of times when we're writing a post, we just want to get right into the meat of it. But you know, we live in an attention economy. So if you don't have something at the beginning of that blog post that, that has some kind of like a, like a hook or an emotional response, something, whether it's, you know, a statistic that's surprising, a controversial statement, a personal story, something to give the reader something to keep moving on, they'll just back out and go to the next site. So introductions are, are super key. So strong I'm introduction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's stop in between each one because okay. I think, you know, let let's... You're a writer, an editor. Let's do the deeper dive into this because sometimes what happens is it's like, you know, my guests will say that and then the audience is saying, well, that's great. You're a writer, but how do you come up with this stuff? Right. And so, you know, let's take a little bit of the the deeper dive in. So one of the things that you talked about, you know, in that introduction is, first of all, if you're talking a standard blog post about how long should that introduction be? My when I'm talking about introductions, I'm really talking about the first several sentences. So, you know, the first couple of paragraphs like that immediate. It's not, you know, we're not writing novels, right? We can't, you know, slowly work our way into the topic because let's be honest, right? No one is sitting in front of the fireplace in their jammies to read your blog post. That's not the kind of reading that's being done. So, yeah, I would say like right to the point. First sentence, first couple of sentences, first couple of paragraphs. So can you give me an example, maybe a couple of examples of some different introductions that maybe just come to mind immediately? Yeah. So I just wrote a newsletter over on LinkedIn about how to make your blog post stickier. And so my first thought was, what's what, what's something else that's sticky? And I thought, oh, I know I make monkey bread every Christmas morning. For, that's a tradition at our house. And so I went with it. I said, hey, look, you know, I talked about my tradition that I have with my family of making monkey bread and how part of what makes monkey bread so good is how it's sticky and oozy and covered in butter and sugar. And then I said, and just like, you know, stickiness is a key part of monkey bread. It's also a key part of your SEO strategy. So I kind of went from there. So if yeah. you see what I did there, it's like now you have this like, oh, wow, this guy's first of all, he's a human being <laughs> who has actual things that he does and traditions that he has. And here's this cool story about what he does with his family on Christmas. Like now I'm interested. So that's one example. Just to throw out another one, just um, to give a bit of a contrast, if maybe you don't have a personal example, let's say I wanted to write a blog post about what we're talking about right now. 
And I would say something I could start with like, hey, studies have shown that 59% of surveyed buyers reported that bad grammar and spelling mistakes would stop them from making a purchase on your website. That's a statistic that probably most people don't know because most people who don't do what we do think, well, who cares if I have a misspelled word or a missing period or something? And to a certain extent, that's correct. I get that. But also the data shows that, well, about 60% of your customers care. So now do I have your attention? So those would be just a couple of examples. And like, where do you get them from? Again, you can get them from your own life. As far as statistics go, I steal them. Like, let's just be honest. I'm not coming up with this stuff. I go out and research and find stuff. But when I find something that piques my interest, I write it down so I can use it later. So, you know, you don't just have to be a super creative person. You can always steal. It's totally fine. And I think, too, you know, sometimes I've just asked a really bold question. Yeah. Like, questions are another great way. Like, just a question that somebody, you know... You know, you're not asking just a normal everyday question. You want to think of something that just kind of rocks the boat, right? So, you know, there are so many ways that you can start things off with just a really interesting. One thing I, I like to do every once in a while, especially with my personal stories, and if it's sort of one that's like a pivotal moment in my life, I cliffhanger it. So, you know, the first sentence or two explains it, but I don't resolve it until the end of the po- the blog post. Yeah, I love that. Like, right, it keeps them engaged. It keeps that reader reading. Like, I got to find out what happened to Kim. Like, I got to find out, right? So that's that's perfect. I love it. You know, like there, there was one time, um, you know, I, I was just trying to think of an example. I'm on the highway in the middle of a busy city. And all of a sudden I realized I can't steer my car. And I heard the belt go snap. (laughs) All right, you got my interest now. I'm interested in this blog post or this article. (laughs) Like what's gonna happen? (laughs) That's a great introduction. and, And so, you know, it doesn't, you know, and we think these stories have to be amazing. They don't have to be these amazing stories. Now, this thing is, is it wasn't a hi- it was a highway in sense. It was called a highway, but it was actually the major road going through a town. So it was like a six lane road, right? But mm. you know, in that moment, you know, do you panic? Like, you know, what are you going to do? Well, first thing I did is I prayed. Mm. <laughs> Second thing is, is that I was right by a moment. And there, there was a driveway, and I thought, I, I'm just going to power steer this thing. And I managed to get, I'm like, Lord, just get me into that parking lot, right? Because if I'm stopped on a road, that's a dangerous situation. You know, if people aren't paying attention, they're going to rear end me, right? So I'm like, God, just get me into that. And I, you know, I just manhandled that wheel and the car slowing down because it's the main belt that runs but you know the lord was good the angels must have been pushing my <laughs> minivan because i made it into like not quite into a parking spot but at least into part of the parking lot where nobody was going to slam into me <laughs> oh it was such a day <laughs> but you know when you just think through your life think through these these types of things and you know, when you look at your topic, and, and it doesn't even have to be your story. You know, you, you can borrow other people's stories. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I, uh, I've done a lot of preaching in my past. And yeah, I mean, I don't have enough stories to fill that many sermons. But yeah, other people sure do. And again, that's where like being a, an avid reader can help. Uh, and just having it top of mind when you're out there in the world, noticing things and and strengthening those connections in your mind to ask that question, hey, would this make a good illustration for something? And then write it down for later, right? Yeah. All right. So we've covered the introduction. What's next, John? Yeah. So introduction is number one. Number two is the structure and format of, let's say, for example, a blog post. And so you need to know a couple of key facts that are going to help you with this. Number one, and these are a couple more statistics for you to grab onto. Number one is 60% of people who are visiting your website are visiting it on, on their phone. So that's important. And number two, 81% of people, and myself included, when they come to your website, they don't read it word for word. They scan it, they skim it, they're they're just quickly going through it to see if it has what they need. So what do you do with those two bits of knowledge? You structure your blog posts in a way that serves them, that relates to them, that gives them uh, you know, more to grab onto. And there's a couple of really easy ways to do that. Number one is to use headers. 
So break up your chunks of text into, you know, two, 300 word uh, sections and then, and then give that a header that tells people that are skimming through your article what the flow is and what's in it for them. And the other piece of advice I can give is use lots of white space. So if you've ever been on a website on your phone and there's just a wall of text staring back at you, you know how hard that is to read. So yeah. don't do that to your customers. Don't do that to your website visitors. Just adopt a simple rule. Make sure all of your paragraphs are two to three sentences long at most. And then, you know, hit enter, start a new paragraph. And we're not in high school English class. It doesn't matter if every paragraph doesn't have a thesis sentence and an example, right? We're not, that's not what we're doing. We're just breaking it up so that people can read it easier on their phones so that they can skim it easier. Because if you do that, then they're going to get to the end of the article, which we'll talk about in a second. And they're going to, they're going to be more prone to go back and, and, and interact with that at a deeper level. Mm, I love it, John. I don't have much to comment on that, but I, I'm going to get you to put on your editor hat there for a minute. Because, you know, one thing, I mean, it just personally drives me nuts, but I think it's it decreases the quality of the writing, um, is when you use the same words over and over again. And, you know, the funny thing is, is, you know, having your best friend who's your editor, she's pretty brutally honest with me. So after a while of doing my writing, she came to me one day and she handed me a list. Well, she emailed it to me. Kim, this is the list of the words that you're only allowed to use once. Here's the list of replacement words I want you to use in your writing because I'm tying tired of doing it for you. <laughs> And I real I, I didn't even know I was doing it, right? And and I think we get into uh, vocabulary patterns. And so you know how important is it to kind of double check your writing, make sure. Um, I have a really good friend I'd like to introduce you to. His name is Thesaurus. <laughs> you know that's actually a pretty big part of my job, as you can imagine. Same with your friend, right? Is because, and that's actually one of the, I think one of the major selling points of reaching out to a, a content editor like me and, and, and hiring me is because I don't have your blind spots. And like yes. you said, you, anybody, all of us, me, myself included, we tend to get into these habits and these patterns and we don't realize it because we're too close to it. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like I have the same list in my head of some of my clients and the words that they overuse and I have to correct. Um, I haven't sent them the list of things to replace it with yet. But that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, maybe your relationship is much closer, I'm guessing. So I, I would probably not do that necessarily. But, you know, in your case, it probably works really well. But yeah, just to have that second set of eyes to say, mm -hmm. you know what, you've used the word however 10 times in this article. Let's see if we can replace or omit some of those. Or what's the one that uh, I see a lot? I have one person, one client who likes to, to introduce paragraphs using four starters, blah, blah, blah. And then the next paragraph, four starters, like, okay, once is fine, but five times is too much. So let's, let's find, yeah, let's dig into the thesaurus. Let's, you know, use chat GPT or something to get us a list of alternatives. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a very yeah, crucial part of what an editor does. So I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I, I really do think everyone should use an editor, right? I think because, like you said, we, we have those blind spots. I have written 150 books. I'm working on my next one. Well, probably oh, I've probably written 150. I've worked on over 200. And so, you know, I've done a lot of writing. There's a reason why I call myself the Extraordinary Word Ninja. It's because I have. But, you know, even still, even with this current book, it goes to my editor, right? Because... Yeah. I want this book to be the best and I I can't see everything that's going on in that book. And so no matter how good of a writer you are, you need an editor. But I think there are ways of improving your own writing so that over time your skills, talents and abilities improve. So, you know, if if you are getting back your work from the editor audience and you see reds Okay, first of all, don't be emotionally attached to that piece of content. Okay, nobody likes getting the red strikes of death from the editor. Okay, me included. 
but you know you can't be emotionally attached to it and you can't your self-confidence can't re be relying upon you know not getting any red stripes because a good editor's job is to make your writing better and there's always ways to make it better but what i started doing is i started going through and looking for the patterns so audience take what the editor is giving you and use it to improve your writing look at the things that the editor is correcting study them and then try to pick one thing you've noticed that you consistently do change it for the next time okay you don't have to change everything just, just change one thing and over time you're going to find your writing greatly improved one of my clients uh, when I first started working with him, he was writing blog posts every week. So part of the deal was, was as I was working on this book, I just gave it to him as a little bonus. Um, he would send me his blog post every week and I would do a light edit. Now, okay, I am not the greatest grammar person. It's one of the reasons why I need an editor. Uh, but I would look at it structurally, I would look at it for flow, I would look at it for repeated words and ideas and concepts. And over time, he said, my writing got so much better because you were pointing out all the little things to me. So take advantage of your editor. You know, John is an amazing editor. When he sends you something back, use it. You're paying him money to do this. Why not learn from him? Yeah, I actually, I actually really appreciate you saying that because it's so true. Like I'm looking stuff up in the dictionary. I'm looking stuff up in the Chicago manual style. Like when you get it back, it is right. I don't care what Grammarly says or whatever, like it's right. So that's a hundred percent correct. You're paying me. I'm trying to give you the best possible product. And yeah, so if you can learn from that, that is wonderful. And I am all for that. I won't feel bad at all if I have to correct fewer mistakes next time around. Like that's, I love that. So yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up. John, the ending. Yes. Okay, so strong introduction. Uh, structure your blog post for skimmers, scanners, mobile users. And then finally, uh, you want to make sure that your ending has a strong call to action to mm -hmm. a product or service you currently offer. So here's another trap that we tend to fall into. So if you own a business or, or you know have a product that you sell or whatever it might be, like we talked about before, you're in it every day. You're like swimming in the sea of your product. So it's very natural for you to just assume that once I get to the end of this blog post, people will obviously know what they should do next. But guess what? We don't. We actually don't have a clue, right? None of us has ESP. And so we don't know what's the next step we should take. So you need to tell yeah. us. You need to be direct and say, what is that next step in the customer journey you want someone to take? Make that your call to action. So it might be read another article. It might be sign up for a newsletter. It might be book a call or buy a product. But whatever it is, do your readers a favor and tell them straight up because we do not know. Well, and even if, even if you are talking about a product in a blog post, people don't have time to figure it out. And they don't want to figure it out. So, you know, at your end, and even if it's not a product and a service, because a lot of the people that are li are listening to this are high level, you know, consultants, professional speakers and coaches, they may not be directly selling products, but direct them to something, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a YouTube video, whether uh, let's say a lead magnet, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you've got a lead magnet, which goes into greater detail on what you were talking about on the blog post. So you, you can give the link to, you know, that lead magnet. Let's say you're on a podcast, you can send the link to, you know, that podcast, all of these things just cement sort of your professionalness. You know, uh, maybe you have a, like a small first time offer, something that's, you know, low cost that you offer or a consultation call but put something don't leave it empty i know because they're just going to close down your website and you'll never see them again you have to have a way of capturing them right and and your blog the way you're talking about doing blog posts john is all about getting their attention providing them with value and then sharing them with them the next step. Audience, if you've listened to this podcast before, you know at the end of every show, 
I tell you where I want you to go next. What is the next related episode that to this one that I would like you to go see? There's a reason for it. Well, to be honest, I'm, I'm trying to get monetized on YouTube, so I need 4,000 watch hours. So that's one of the reasons. Hey, just that's totally cool. That's okay. Like, be honest about I, it. Yeah. <laughs> but also, if you've enjoyed this topic, then, you know, with over 500 episodes, I have other ones that you would enjoy as well. So, John, we're going to shift gears here because I want to ask the question that I ask everyone who is not an author. So John is a writer and an editor proofreader, but he's not an author yet. And that's cool. We can work on that one. Yeah, I think we can work on that one. <laughs> but John, if you were to write a book to uh, promote your expertise and your agency, what you write about? I would write a book. So again, I'm an editor first and foremost, and then I do other things as well. I, I would write a book that explains the value of what I do, because the idea that most people have in their heads is that an editor is going to fix a misspelled word here and there, find a period or that's, that should be there that isn't, maybe switch a colon to a semicolon and who cares? That is the furthest thing from what I actually do. So I would yeah. want to write a book that that says, look, if you are wondering what value a, a content editor provides to you, well, there's a ton of them, right? I can help make your blog posts to resonate with readers. I can help improve your uh, your CTR, your, your click-through rates. I can help you get more customers. I can give you back time in your life to do something else besides editing your own blog post because you may not want to do that. Um, I can partner with you as another business person to help you meet your goals. Like that's ultimately what, what we do as a content editor. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than just finding and fixing grammar mistakes, although that is a component of it. So I would actually write a book that explores all these different ways you know, hiring someone like me is actually an investment and provides you with value and is a smart business move. So if I, you know, if I wrote a book, that would be what it would be. Nice. I like it. I like it. John, we are almost out of time. So what I would love for you to do is share one final thought. And if you have a freebie or something you'd like to offer the audience, now's the time. I do. If you have enjoyed this conversation and you want to know more and you want to say, how do I actually put into practice these things that we've been talking about? You can actually go to my website. It's cedarpressproofreading.com. And there's a free blog self-assessment you can download. And it gives you 15 different um, areas to look at and to evaluate your own writing as it stands today and identify those ways that you can start to tweak and update and just make your content better and resonate more and get more views, get more customers out of it. So yeah, go to my website, uh, cedarpressproofreading.com, download that PDF guide. And if you need help with it, contact me. One final thought, John. Yeah. One final thought. Um, I just am appreciative that as an author, you understand the value of editing so much. I, you know, I think about it like, you know, Stephen King is one of the greatest authors of our generation. He has an editor, you know? So as good as a, as a writer as you think you might be, or even as you are, you always need that help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more, John. John, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Kim. I have enjoyed our discussion. Me too. Audience, so I'm going to put into practice what I said in the show. Where do you go to next? I want you to go back to episode 510, Marketing Your Book to Build Your Business. And if you're on YouTube, you know the routine. My daughter has placed the thumbnail here somewhere on this screen. And maybe one of these days, I might actually have a few minutes to figure out where she puts it. I don't know. <laughs> As an entrepreneur, sometimes life just gets so busy. But anyway, it is here for you to click on. If you're on your favorite podcast app, you're going to be scanning back about probably about 10, 11 episodes. And it's another great one for you that's going to help you take your content and use the power of words to build your business. Have a great day, everyone. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye now. You've been listening, listening to the, the Author to Authority, to Authority Podcast. Podcast. The Extraordinary, Extraordinary Word Ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder, has helped over 200 entrepreneurs, professionals, speakers, and coaches write and publish their books that have become incredible marketing tools for their business. 
And many of those have gone on to become Amazon best-selling authors and have used their books to land high-level clients and get on big stages. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at www.author2authoritypodcast.com. See you next time.